any questions, um, please interrupt me at any point. Okay, so let me begin with some motivation. Um, we've obviously spent a lot of time in the string community working on supersymmetric string vacua. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, one of the most important challenges for us is to try and understand the non-supersymmetric world. And of course, we know for particle physics, um, we don't see supersymmetry at low energies. Um, for cosmology, if we want to understand inflation or any interesting cosmological background, these are non-supersymmetric. So to understand them in string theory, we need to understand non-supersymmetric backgrounds. And then finally, something I'm gonna be focusing on mainly, or almost exclusively in this talk, is the question about non-supersymmetric ADS-CFT to try and understand uh, non-supersymmetric strongly coupled quantum field theories, uh, for example, arising in condensed matter theory. Now, uh, studying non-supersymmetric solutions is very difficult. Um, firstly, even the construction is a lot harder than supersymmetric ones because we don't have PPS relations. So in general, we have to solve second order partial differential equations. <clears throat> so even just this first step is a lot harder um, in a non-supersymmetric case compared to the supersymmetric case. But of course, you wanna do much more than just finding solutions. We also wanna study these solutions. And in particular, we want to understand the fluctuations. And the key question that arises in non-supersymmetric vacua is whether these backgrounds are actually stable. So if the fluctuations um, cause some instabilities. And doing this, even in 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity, let alone all of string theory is extremely challenging. And so typically one very useful tool is to not worry about the full 10 or 11 dimensional string theory and instead use some lower dimensional model. And this is useful uh, for several reasons. From the lower dimensional perspective, we have then just some finite number of fields, um, whereas if we consider the full 10 or 11 dimensional uh, supergravity and we viewed from a lower dimensional perspective, this would give rise to infinitely many fields. So having some true lower dimensional models means we just give some small number of these fields and this makes it much easier to construct solutions. Um, also this lower dimensional uh, theory typically has some interesting potentials and we can also then uh, work with these finite number of fields that we have and easily study the fluctuations in a way that is uh, fairly well understood and at least understand stability with respect to these finite number of fields. Now, of course, the huge issue is that this also only captures some part of the physics. Uh, in particular, it only captures the physics carried by these finite number of fields that we're keeping, not the full 10 or 11 dimensional physics. Um, now, in this talk, I'm going to be mostly looking at, or almost exclusively looking at ADS vacua with very few comments about non-ADS. Um, and in this case, these issues are particularly acute. So if we look at ADS vacua times some compact space, uh, we don't have scale separation between the ADS vacuum and the compact space. And this is certainly true for all explicitly known ADS vacua of string theory. And it's also believed to be true. This is uh, part of the small plant conjectures. It's also believed to be true in general, but certainly all explicitly known ADS vacuum have this property. That there's no scale separation. One comment, yeah. please. Yes, please. Uh, it is believed by some to be true. Yes, That's exactly. It, it is believed by some to be true, and there's arguments about this, but uh, certainly all explicitly known ADS vacuum don't have this fact. Absolutely. And if you're unhappy with this fact, you can just focus on the subset of ADS factor, which is this true, that there's no scale separation. Um, so because there's no scale separation, um, we cannot perform what we normally do in string theory, which is to get some effective theory where we get rid of all the fields above some mass scale. This we cannot do. Um, and so in particular, we need to find some different way of choosing which fields to keep in the lower dimensional model. And one useful way of doing this is by imposing what, we, what is called a consistent truncation. 
Now, <clears throat> consistent truncation is a technical term with a technical definition. So if you don't like the term consistent in this sense, then you can call it whatever you want. It has a very precise definition. So a consistent truncation is where you impose that the finite number of fields you keep on this compact space are such that once you get your lower dimensional theory, all the solutions of the lower dimensional theory are also solutions of the original high dimensional theory. This is what's known as a consistent truncation. And I will I'll talk about this in more detail very soon. Now, the one thing I want to emphasize at this point is that this is just very difficult to do in general because the equations of motions are typically very nonlinear. And so constructing these consistent truncations is uh, very challenging, it used to be very challenging. However, if we do have this, then we can come back to the point I mentioned earlier, then we have some lower dimensional model in which it is much easier to construct solutions, much easier to study the subset of fluctuations that we've kept. And in particular, these lower dimensional models are much, much better at uh, finding non-specimetric solutions. So <clears throat> one interesting fact that arises though is that Already in these lower dimensional models where we only keep a subset of fluctuations, almost all of the non-supersymmetric ADS solutions that are found are unstable. So uh, I've cited here two recent papers um, which used machine learning to look for non-supersymmetric ADS solutions of, some, of two different uh, lower dimensional models, which in particular do arise from consistent truncations. For example, in this first paper, Komsa, Pirsch, and Fischbacher, they find something of the order of 200 non-supersymmetric solutions, and there is just one single um, non-supersymmetric ADS solution that's already stable in the lower dimensional theory. Uh, sorry, Emmanuel, let me try to clarify a little bit what you're sure. saying here. Uh, there are two types of stability that people talk about when they talk about ADS. One is that in the language of the dual field theory, there are relevant operators, or that they there are operators that violate the BF bound. Which one do you mean? I mean uh, the BF bound. Okay, I see. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, I mean here really um, uh, well, what you would normally call perturbative stability or perturbative instability. That all the masses are above the BF bound to be stable, and if some masses are below the BF bound, then it's unstable. And already requiring stability in these lower dimensional models where you're only keeping some finite subset of all the infinitely many fields, you find that almost all um, non-specific ADS solutions are already unstable. So now an interesting question is, these very few non-specific solutions that are stable in this lower dimensional theory, are they also stable in the full 10 or 11 dimensional theory. Um, and well, there was maybe various reasons why people hope that this might be true. Uh, the first is that, well, somehow they should be distinguished because there's so few of them. Maybe these have very special properties. But then also there was this intuition that came in particular from looking at, for example, ADS five times S5, where we could compute the full spectrum of supergravity fields in the low dimensional theory. And then you find that the modes that you're keeping in the consistent truncations are typically some lowest lying modes and some Kaluza Klein towers, so that the modes, <clears throat> the modes that you haven't kept typically become heavier and not lighter than the modes that you have kept. So somehow the modes that were kept, you can think of maybe as the zero modes and all the higher modes maybe are heavier. So if the zero modes are already stable then the higher modes should have just be more stable rather than less stable in particular should not cause any instabilities. But this used to be a not, uh, difficult open question because computing the spectrum for non specimetric solutions used to be essentially impossible. Um, but now I want to show you some progress on this question. So in particular in this talk, I want to address two questions. The first is how do we uplift these lower dimensional models that I've been talking about, so-called lower dimensional gauge supergravities to string theory. So in particular, how do we perform the consistent truncation? 
And then secondly, once we know how these lower dimensional models and these lower dimensional non-specimetric ADS solutions are embedded in string theory, can we actually compute the full spectrum of masses and in particular determine the full perturbative stability in 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity? So this will be what I will tell you about in this talk. And um, the outline is as follows. I will introduce exceptional field theory um, and explain to you how it can be used to construct these consistent truncations. I will then talk about <clears throat> uh, my very recent work, which is developing this Kaluza Klein spectroscopy that allows us to compute um, the masses of all the fields um, that arise in these compactifications. And then finally, I will talk about the question of stability with various examples. Okay, so are there any questions about this very general motivation part of the talk? Okay, I think there's none, so I will continue. <clears throat> so now I want to make more precise uh, of how we construct these consistent truncations. So the goal is to find some way of embedding in a nonlinear fashion this lower dimensional theory that we're interested in, the lower dimensions of the gravity, into the full 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity. And the key requirement is that all solutions of the lower dimensional supergravity should also be solutions of the original 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity that we truncated. And this is extremely difficult, like I already mentioned, because the equations of motions are extremely nonlinear. So choosing modes such that you have this property is very difficult. Um, and in particular, uh, symmetry arguments are absolutely crucial uh, for the construction of these truncations and to prove the consistency. So let me make this more precise. One way of constructing these consistent truncations has been understood for a long time. And this is <clears throat> if we consider a group manifold. So I've shown here the very simple example of the circle. And there is a key property of group manifolds that is useful for us two key properties. The first is that we have a global set of vector fields, the frame fields, or if you want the uh, left invariant vector fields on the group manifold. So this is the first property. We have some frame, which in this case for a d-dimensional group manifold would just be some, uh, if I view this as a matrix, as some invertible matrix, d by d matrix. And then the second key property is that the Lie algebra of these uh, vector fields closes into an algebra. And in this case, the structure constants of the algebra would be exactly the structure constants of the Lie algebra of the, of the group manifold. <clears throat> and these two properties are enough to ensure a consistent truncation. And in particular, then it's very easy to construct a consistent truncation. All we have to do is we take our original fields and we simply uh, multiply according to the index structure, the field with the respective uh, D by D matrix that comes from the frame field. So for example, the metric has two, uh, let's say 10 dimensional um, indices. Uh, sorry, and this would be the indices on the group manifold. So let's say D dimensional indices. So then you would just multiply this with the U inverse uh, frame field, and this then carries all of the dependence on the internal space, on the group manifold, and the coefficients in this expansion would just be some lower dimensional fields, which make up the lower dimensional um, theory that you obtain. Okay. But this is, I mean, this is very nice, very simple, but it's been also known for a while that there are other consistent truncations that don't come from group manifolds. So don't obviously come from group manifolds. And one famous example of this, or one very interesting example of this, is if we look at um, a theory in D plus two dimensions, consisting of Einstein gravity, some Maxwell field, and some dilaton field, uh, with an action of this form, then there is a consistent truncation when there is a very particular coupling, as shown here, between the scalar field and the Maxwell field. So for some very particular value of this constant alpha, there exists a consistent truncation on the two sphere. Before this consistent on, truncation on the two sphere, we get some d-dimensional theory of gravity coupled to now 
uh, non-abelian uh, young mills with SU2 gauge group and scalar fields, <coughs> etc. And this was constructed essentially by brute force in this paper listed here. And I've just shown the consistent truncation ansatz, not for you to try and understand it, but just to show it's very complicated. It involves various complicated objects that you define on S2, and it's sort of a miracle that this works. But <clears throat> there's a different way to understand this. And this is that for this very particular value of alpha, where the consistent truncation exists, this Einstein Maxwell Dilaton theory is actually nothing but GR in one higher dimension. So if I perform obviously GR, if I consider just gravity in, a, in one higher dimension, I do a <clears throat> reduction on a circle, I get exactly an Einstein Maxwell Dilaton theorem with a very particular coupling between the Maxwell and, Dilla, Maxwell and Dilaton theory. And it turns out that exactly for that coupling, there is the truncation, the consistent truncation on this too. But now this miraculous consistent truncation on this too is much easier to understand. In fact, what happens is this vibration of S1 over S2 is non-trivial. And in fact, what we have is a consistent truncation of this higher dimensional gravitational theory on S3. And S3, of course, is a group manifold SU2. And this way of writing it as S1 pi out of S2 is exactly the hop vibration of S3. And in this case, it's much easier to understand what we have the consistent truncation. We're working on a group manifold. And on this group manifold, we have a globally well-defined frame field. And its Lie bracket closes into a Lie algebra with structure constants given by SU2. And these structure constants then also define the lower dimensional gauge group that we obtain. And in particular, the truncation on that is much simpler. Rather than the very complicated formula I've shown you earlier, the truncation on that exact, again has this very simple form where we just multiply all the objects with appropriate uh, frame fields, these U matrices. Now, so this clearly shows <clears throat> sometimes a truncation, a consistent truncation exists. It's very complicated, but in reality, there is some group manifold underlying it just by. Uh, in particular, in this case, what happened is we have to unify the gravitational field with the Maxwell field and the Dilaton field. And we can do this unification by rewriting the theory as a gravitational theory in one higher dimension with the usual Kaluza Klein um, ansatz. Okay. But then there's also other consistent truncations that seem to even go beyond this. In particular, there's the famous consistent truncation of 11 dimensional supergravity on the seventh sphere described by David and Nikolai, which give us this uh, maximally supersymmetric four-dimensional gauge theory uh, with SO8 gauge group. And here, there's really no obvious way in which there's some higher dimensional gravitational theory, which would give us a group manifold. However, we can play the same game. So we can now think about the fact that we have 11-dimensional supergravity, which means we don't just have a gravitational theory, we also have fluxes. And we can unify these <clears throat> and this way describe some larger geometry. And this is exactly what exceptional field theory does. So in particular, to be concrete, if we consider type to be supergravity on some four dimensional space times some six dimensional compactification, then if we look at all the fields which are scalars from the four dimensional perspective, so fields all of whose legs are on this compactification space, then all of these fields, it turns out, can be rearranged into some representation of the symmetry group, of the group E7. In particular, they make up what's known as the generalized metric, which parameterizes this coset space E77 over SU8. Now, if you haven't worked much with uh, Lie groups, this E77 just refers to some particular non-compact version of the compact group E7. And the maximal compact subgroup of this particular non-compact form is SU8. So this is very similar to how you would write a metric as uh, an element of a course at GLD over SOD. In this case, you have this exceptional form of a metric, which lives in this course as E77 over SU8. And all of these uh, 
bosonic fields of type 2b supergravity with all of the legs on the compactification space, it turns out, can be rearranged into this concept, E77 over SUA. <clears throat> but in fact, this appearance of the exceptional group goes even beyond this. In particular, if we look at the local symmetry group of our theory, we have a uh, obviously gravitational theory. So we have diffeomorphism symmetries generated by vector fields. And then all of these gauge fields also shift, uh, also have um, local gauge transformations generated by p-forms. If you combine all of these together, these again form some representation of this exceptional group E7. In particular, they form the 56 dimensional representation of this exceptional group. And moreover, we can write down then an action of these gauge parameters on all of these fields, which generalizes the usual notion of a lead derivative, which would, form, which would generate diffeomorphisms generated by vector fields. So in this case, we have what's known as the generalized lead derivative, which generates uh, generalized diffeomorphisms consisting of diffeomorphisms in all of the gauge transformations, and just gives us the local gauge trans the local symmetries of all of these fields. And this generalized lead derivative has a very uh, simple form. It's given by a transport term, just like the usual lead derivative. But then um, if you want the rotation term now is the derivative of the generalized vector field projected into the adjoint of E7. So once again, you see this exceptional group appearing. And if you act with this object on this generalized metric with the right parameterization, you find exactly that you recover the symmetry rules of all of these fields of type 2D supergravity. Uh, now, sorry, Emmanuel, let me ask a question yeah. here because I'm a little bit confused. This is the structure more or less we know happens when you take type 2B supergravity, you compactify on a torus. Now, you seem to be claiming that you're going to use this more generally. So I don't understand what's the extra step here. Right. So um, <clears throat> let's see. So uh, I mean, uh, I guess you're saying this E7 group arises normally as a U-duality group when you perform a torus reduction. Right. Now, this is not what I'm doing. I'm really just looking at the full 10-dimensional theory, and I'm just reorganizing fields. I'm not doing any transplication, no reduction. I have full 10-dimensional dependence. All of my fields can depend on any of the 10 coordinates on M4 and C6, and I'm just splitting them. With respect to how they transform under this, under the uh, different morphisms on M4. So, in particular, if I look at all of the fields which are scalars with respect to M4, then these turn out to form this coset space E77 over SUA. And similarly, I can look at all of the symmetries of these fields and the symmetry parameters again. What does it mean that they form this space? What, how is this reflected in the equations? So at this point, I haven't yet spoken about equations or equations of motion. I'll come to that soon. This is, at the moment, if you want, this is just counting. Okay. So okay. if you look at these fields, you can count how many they are, and you okay. Can, okay. And these can be, you know, they they match the degrees of freedom of this coset space. Similarly, if you count how many parameters you have, there's 56 of them, which is a representation of these seven. Then the first. If you want a slightly more non-trivial step here is that, in fact, you can write down some action of this 56 on this object, which is compatible with E7, and this is this generalized lead derivative. Okay, thank you. No problem. Now I should say here, I write this partial M, which uh, this capital M is some E7 index, in particular the 56 dimensional representation of E7, but this is really just the usual type to be coordinates embedded in this 56 dimensional object. So only in this case, six of them, these are the coordinates on C6, only six of them are non-trivial, the other ones are zero. So this is just some way of making it look E7 covariant. But at this point, you know, there's, there's really, there is some way of breaking the E7 because we're choosing six of these coordinates to be non-zero and the other ones to be trivial. Okay. But now maybe let me come to uh, uh, answer Elias's point more. We can also rewrite the type to be supergravity action. So the full 10 dimensional action has uh, some particular form, the Ricci scalar, um, the B field uh, field strength squared, uh, 
uh, scalar kinetic terms, and then also all the more and more forms. And it turns out that we can write this full 10 dimensional action in terms of these objects which transform nicely under E7. In particular, uh, we can write down an action which involves two derivatives of this generalized metric. Um, that's various other terms, but in a way that is really respects all of this E7 symmetry. Okay. And then actually this action can be understood in a much nicer way geometrically, in particular, because we now have this generalized notion of a lead derivative, we can talk about generalized tensors. And actually you can recover this action as some sort of generalized Ricci scalar um, of this exceptional symmetry group. So you can really think of this geometrically in terms of this generalized notion of geometry, or you can just write down what it is and write down two derivatives of your generalized metric squared, et cetera. Okay, now once you've done this, and here comes the first payoff, you now find that in fact, all of the consistent truncations that were known earlier are actually captured by a generalization of a group manifold to this exceptional setting. In particular, <clears throat> what looks like a miraculous consistent truncation on some complicated geometry with fluxes, from for example, 11 dimensional supergravity or type 2b supergravity, takes a much simpler form once we embed this in exceptional field theory, and in particular, it takes the form as some uh, standard, um, or if you want, generalized group manifold uh, reduction. And in particular, what do I mean by this generalized group manifold? I mean that now, again, we have some generalized frame field. So in particular, now, a global set of generalized vector fields, uh, which now make up an E7 matrix. And they're generalized Lie bracket coming from the generalized Lie derivative. This also closes in terms of some structure constants, which I call X, A, B, C. And these structure constants will then tell you what the gauge group is of the lower dimensional supergravity that you're getting. And in particular, you can write down the truncation answer. It's exactly like before, where you expand all of your fields and all of the dependence on the compactification space is just carried by these E7 valued matrices, these new matrices. So this is very analogous to the group manifold truncation with the key difference that now we're talking about the generalized frame field, which makes up an element of E7, and rather than using the usual Lie bracket, you use this generalized Lie bracket. Okay, and so a manifold on which I have this global set of generalized vector fields making up the E7 matrix and where the generalized Lie derivative of these things closes into an algebra, this is what I would call a generalized group manifold. And the more proper technical term for this is the generalized Leibniz parallelized manifold. But in particular, this way we can recover all of the known consistent truncations and also construct new ones. And this has been done in various examples and has given us consistent truncations on spheres, hyperboloids, and various products thereof by very many different people. And this is very useful because this truncation ansatz is now very simple. And in particular, um, <clears throat> we typically construct the consistent truncation around some very symmetric, um, sorry, some very symmetric form of the compactification. So for example, ADS4 times the round seven sphere. And this would then correspond to the origin of our lower dimensional scalar manifold. But now we also know what happens to this compactification as we look at some other um, at some other critical point of lower dimensional theory, which comes by turning on some of the scalar fields. And in particular, all that you have to do to reconstruct the full 10 dimensional or 11 dimensional geometry is you multiply by some E7 <coughs> matrix, which is this MAB object. So all of the deformation now gets carried into just multiplication by an E7 matrix. And this will be very useful um, for the rest of this talk. Emmanuel, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So you seem to be to be saying that there, there, there is an action of the E seven seven group on, on this uh, theory, but that seems to I mean, it's a bit surprising given that your choice of coordinate derivative picks only one particular direction inside the representation. Theory. 
Uh, yes, good. So um, let me maybe, so I'm actually going to say something slightly different in the next talk, in the next slide, but it also comes back to this point. So I'll just come back to this question in a minute, if that's okay. okay. So um, in, if we go back to this first example that I gave you, where this einstein maxwell dilaton theory and its consistent location can be better understood in terms of the higher dimensional theory that comes by uplifting on the circle, which would then just give us a gravitational theory in one higher dimension. What we've done in exceptional field theory is very similar. We have some larger notion of geometry, which comes by unifying the fluxes in the metric. But you might ask, is there also somehow this higher dimensional theory, just like here? In this case, of course, um, this einstein maxwell dilaton theory comes by saying all the fields are independent of the S1. Um, but of course, this higher dimensional theory also makes sense by having completely general dependence on the circle, and then it's a true uh, theory in one higher dimension. So can you do something similar with exceptional field theory? Is there really some higher dimensional space that underlies it? In particular, if I come back to uh, the point that was just made by the audience, I come back to the generalized lead derivative, for example, and these derivatives, can I just take these to be general, or do I have to restrict that most of these um, are trivial? So the answer to this is uh, no. So you, there is no higher dimensional space underlying central field theory, at least not in this sense. These derivatives are always constrained. In particular, if you ask, for example, the generalist new derivative to close into an algebra, which of course it should if it's the symmetry algebra of some theory, then you have to impose some condition on these derivatives, in particular on any two derivatives acting on any one or two objects of the theory projected in a certain way has to vanish. And this is known as the section condition in particular. This equation here is just some E77 covariant way of saying actually there's only seven or six non-trivial derivatives. And this way you will always break E7 so that there is only if you want some GL6 uh, covariance truly there, if you choose six coordinates or some GL7, if you have seven non-trivial coordinates. Now the question was, okay, but in what sense does all of this E7 story make sense then and so on? And <clears throat> I think, I mean, the, the point here really is that if this weren't true, then you wouldn't really be doing uh, anything non-trivial. So, the point here is we multiply by any seven matrix, and of course, the 10 or 11 dimensional geometry is really something different. It's a new vacuum. And this arises because, of course, this new vacuum, which comes by multiplying with any seven matrix, looks different with respect to the six or seven coordinates that are really non trivial. Right? So, this E7 symmetry that you have, it's there in the action. You can use it to generate new solutions, but they really are different solution in 10 to 11 dimensional geometry because um, the, the way that the physical coordinates align inside the full 56 dimensional and seven matrix changes. Does that answer the question that came from the audience? Well, it's not clear that you get new solutions by doing this because if you have like E7 uh, matrix, you're going to go to another uh, uh, solution of this section condition. But if you want to interpret it in terms of supergravity fields, you probably have to rotate it back to uh, the original one. No? Right. So this is indeed. So, so this is not the case. I mean, um, <clears throat> so in particular, if you want, um, keep the keep the coordinates. You, you keep your choice of coordinates fixed, and you just multiply by the C seven matrix. This you know really then just changes all of the entries that are in this generalized metric. And then you still pick up, okay, now what's the metric, what's the two-form field, what's the four-form field, etc. And all of those values will have changed. So this will correspond to some new geometry. But you can also show that this multiplication is really, you know, it respects the equation of motions, etc. So you really are generating new solutions. Sorry, I made a little bit wet. Boris is saying it's true, right? Because if generally you will get a new coordinate dependent, which correspond to windings of uh, <coughs> of rain, etc., that cannot be interpreted directly into variability. So if you want to match the solution in type to this variability to another solution in type to this variability or in even dimensional variability, you have a very restricted set of 
Um, no, I, I think, okay, I think maybe we're, just, we're talking about slightly different things. So what is happening here, um, and sorry, thanks for clarifying that was Boris. I didn't recognize the voice and I, you're all very small in the video. So I, I, yeah, yeah, I recognized you, Guillaume. So, um, <clears throat> so what happens, you know, really view the coordinates as fixed, okay? Now this E7 multiplication changes the entries of your 56 by 56 generalized metric. So it really just changes what would be the metric and so on. Guillaume, what you're saying is that somehow, of course, what I cannot do is in general, or if I, if I were to keep the metric and the two form and the four form, et cetera, all of these things fixed, then what I would be doing is I would be changing what I call coordinates and what I would be calling winding coordinates. So in that sense, yes, I mean, then this would be some weird a uh, perspective where somehow the geometry is the same, but you've changed what are momentum modes and winding modes. But I don't think that's a very helpful perspective in this case. Keep your coordinates fixed. You have the same 10 dimensional theory and you're changing what you call, you know, you, you're really deforming your 10 dimensional metric, your 10 dimensional fluxes and so on. But in particular, you will still solve the equations of motion. Uh, can I ask a related question? Of if course. you were doing what you are doing here from a standard, you know, compactification, that would be what people call, um, you know, generalized uh, Serge Schwartz uh, compactification. Uh, the point is that you are doing something more general because this doesn't uh, reduce from a gravity theory in some higher dimension, right? Uh, yes. So this is exactly. So this there but is it, first of all there is no real higher dimensional theory. You know, this is right. 10 or 11 dimensional theory, but we're changing our notion of geometry in 10 or 11 dimensional to be this exceptional field theory or exceptional generalized geometry. So, I mean, for the okay, perspective of my talk, these are okay. really the same thing. I hope I have uh, given sufficient clarification. If not, um, maybe uh, Boris and or Guillaume can uh, ask me more at the end. Would that be all right? And then I can continue for now? Yes, sure. Okay, very good. So having done all of this, let me now show you how we can also learn about the full spectrum of producer client fields on these compactifications in particular, going beyond the modes that we've kept in the location. So let me review uh, just again briefly what, uh, what we normally would do. So if we have a consistent location, we have some lower dimensional theory, it has some lower dimensional potential different, uh, typically corresponding to interest, which would have different critical points that would be interesting. And in particular, because we've performed this consistent location, we typically only keep some small subset of the full field. So for example, for ADS 5 times 5, we would keep these modes that are circled here in red these scalar modes rather than all of the modes that arise in ADS 5 times S5. But of course, by going to some different critical point, because we have this uh, consistent location, we can also compute then <clears throat> uh, all of the properties of the fields around this lower dimensional point. In particular, we can also compute the masses of the fields that we have kept as we deform the internal space to go to this other critical points. So we can see how all of these masses change. The things that we don't have access to with this consistent location is all of the modes we haven't kept. All of the modes that we haven't kept, the masses would also change as we deform the geometry. But with the consistent location by itself, we have no idea what happens to these other masses. And now, uh, with Henning Zamtleben, uh, we showed, uh, I guess, two years ago now, a year and a half ago now, that actually using exceptional field theory, we can regain access to all of these other modes that we haven't kept in the consistent truncation, and in particular find how the masses of all of these other modes change as we deform the compactification by going to a different critical point of the lower dimensional theory. Okay, so <clears throat> why is this so useful? Well, usually in the traditional approach with Kaluza Klein uh, spectroscopy, there were really only two cases that were well understood. Um, this first is if you ask what is the Kaluza-Klein spectrum of the gravitons from the lower dimensional perspective, this 
is something that could be computed for general compactification. But if you ask for the Kaluza kind spectrum of all the fields, particularly the scalar fields, this used to be impossible for general compactifications. And in fact, it was only understood for compactifications that correspond to some uh, symmetric space, G over H. Now, with this method that Henning and I have developed, what we can now do is we can also compute the full spectrum around any of these compactifications of the lower dimensions of the gravity. And in particular, these different critical points, they can break lots or even all of the symmetries or even supersymmetries. So this now, for the first time, gives us access to the kind of spectrum around compactifications, which are very non-symmetric and even non-supersymmetric. So why is this difficult? Um, the, if you've never done these computations, you would think maybe this is something very straightforward. Uh, the typical example you have in mind when you do when you think about Kaluza Klein <clears throat> masses is a free scalar field on a circle. So uh, here the circle coordinate would be this y coordinate, x is just some lower, some other set of coordinates. The um, equation of motion for the free scalar field is just this Laplacian. And of course, now by looking at the Kaluza Klein models on a circle, what you do is you expand phi in eigenmodes of this operator D2Y. On the circle, this will just correspond to a Fourier series and the different modes in the Fourier series would become massive and their masses are given by the mode number squared divided by the radius of this circle squared. Oh, sorry. Now, doing the same thing for supergravity is um, really challenging, even for some very, very symmetric space like ADS5 times S5. In particular, what you have to do is you have to expand all of the fluctuations around this background in different sets of tensor harmonics on the S5. So the metric, this would have some, you know, the internal metric on S5, this would then need some harmonic which are symmetric uh, two tensor representation, the two forms, we need two form reps, uh, harmonics, etc. You have to plug all of these into the equations of motions. These are very difficult, even at the linearized level, they're highly non-trivial. So here I've just written down one of the equations of motions coming from the fluctuation of the metric. Again, the details are not important. Just to show you that it's very complicated, it mixes the metric fluctuations with fluctuations of the phi form. And then you have to diagonalize all of this system. So this can be done for ADS5 times S5, but already it's extremely challenging. And for less symmetric spaces, um, we really have no idea how to understand this operator, what the eigenmodes of this operator should be or how they should be understood, what's it, what we would call harmonics, etc. Now with the exception of field theory, the picture is very different. In particular, in this method with Henning Sampleben, uh, what you can do is you first compute the spectrum, well, you first compute the spectrum around the max symmetric point of your consistent locations where all of the scalar fields are turned off. And for the, in the compactification has some large amount of symmetry. And then uh, the very nice thing is that now you can also look at the different critical points where the compactification is deformed. And this is very simple because all you have to do to capture this deformation of the compactification is you have to multiply by an E7 matrix. So this whole deformation and the effect on the Kaluza Klein spectrum will be captured by some. E7 matrix multiplication corresponding to the scalar fields that you turn off um, to deform the space. Okay. So let me show you uh, briefly what is involved. So even this Kaluza Klein spectroscopy at the max symmetric point is already much simpler in the exceptional field theory. So if you think about ADS5 times S5, it's much simpler doing this in the exceptional field theory than in the usual approach. <coughs> So for concreteness, let me talk about uh, some ADS4 times S7, let's say, with some E77 matrix. And the benefit that we now have in exceptional field theory, because we have a consistent truncation, we know that there is this E77 valued matrix that is the generalized frame field. And in particular, because it's a generalized frame field that's globally well defined, it actually gives a basis for all of the fields of our theory. As a result of this, 
all of the tensor structure of the theory can be captured by this uh, basis element. And in turn, we can think of all of the fields as just scalars from uh, the internal space. And all of the tensor structure will just be carried by the U matrices. In particular, then, we only need scalar harmonics on the compactification space rather than harmonics in different kinds of representations as you would need to if you were doing this in the traditional approach, where, as I said, you would expand the metric and some symmetric two tensor harmonics, and then the fluxes would need different kinds of uh, anti symmetric tensor representations of the harmonics. Here in the exceptional field theory, you just use scalar harmonics, which already makes the analysis for the maxis symmetric point much simpler. In particular, um, if you look at the generalized metric, this is some element of E77 over SU8 in exceptional field theory. And so you can write down a small deformation around uh, the maxi-symmetric point. This would be some deformation of an E77 over SU8 element. So it would just be captured by something valued in this Lie algebra, E77 minus SU8. So linear order, this would be a general deformation of your E77 over SU8 coset element. And then, as I said, all of the tensor structure is just carried by these U matrices. And so this Lie algebra valued element is really a scalar from the internal perspective. And so you can write down the general um, E77 minus SU8 Lie algebra valued element by just expanding in some complete basis of scalar harmonics, which are these things that I call here Y sigma. So sigma is just an index that runs that labels all of the scalar harmonics on your space, and you can write down the general linear deformation in this form. Emmanuel, can I ask a question? Yes. I'm, I'm confused by multiple. So, I mean, these are um, harmonics with regard to a Laplacian, which is defined in this in this large space, right, of, um, of this representation of E77? I mean, the no, so in this case, these are really the scalar harmonics on your maximally symmetric compactification. So to be concrete, think about uh, ADS4 times S7. Here, I really mean the scalar harmonics on the seven sphere. So mm -hmm. these are just a complete basis um, of any function that I can write on the seven sphere. Um, and I can expand any deformation of the seven sphere in terms of any scalar deformation of the seventh sphere in terms of its scalar harmonics. I see. Okay. 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 Well, it's really... Really... Sorry, if you want to describe the fermions, you probably also need some half integer spin harmonics as well. Uh, actually, no. Um, so it turns out that even for the fermions, uh, you do something funny in exceptional field theory. I'm completely ignoring fermions, but. Um, even for fermions, uh, if you want the fermionic nature again, will be carried by um, the, the, the fermionic nature will be carried by some fermionic version of these U matrices. And then again, you will have just scalars on the internal space. So you will just use scalar harmonics, even for the fermions. Um, because the fermionic nature will come by not using these U matrices, but uh, if you want some kind of square root of the U matrix, that would be like the fermionic uh, frame field. Yeah. And I just think of this as the fact that maximal supersymmetry organizes things into super conformal multiplets where all you need to know is the scalar and everything else falls out. Is, is more being said? I, I think, I yes, I, I think this is a useful way to think about this. Um, Maybe the, so let me make a couple of comments. Firstly, um, that's not obvious if you want in the usual supergravity approach, but indeed from that kind of, from that, you know, um, from the super multiplet structure, you would have always expected something like this to appear. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing <clears throat> that is extremely non-trivial is that you can do this, and I will show this in a second, and you can still use the same organization, even when you deform the compactification space so that you break supersymmetry. Moreover, you can apply this to examples where this max symmetric point is actually not a vacuum of your theory. This is just some point that you choose in which you do an expansion. 
it doesn't actually have to be a solution of the equations of motion. Um, I'll give an example of when this happens uh, later. And then, you know, there's no reason why anything should organize with respect to some maximally supersymmetric supermultiplet structure. So um, I think Eric's point is a good one and it's, it's, it, it explains why this works. But somehow the fact that it works even for the non-supersymmetric cases or the less supersymmetric cases and the cases which really don't arise as deformation of some maximum supersymmetric vacuum, I think is non-trivial. Um, right, so in particular, I guess one thing that was known for a while, and I think this is related to Eric's uh, point, is that I can write down the Kaluza Klein ansatz um, if I just look at, you know, if I just want to look at the group theory of what are my Kaluza Klein fields, then it was known for a long time that all I have to do is I have to look at the group structure of the fields of the lower dimensional theory that are kept in the consistent calculation, and I just tensor with the scalar harmonics, and this would certainly give me the right group structure. Here, what's very nice is that you see this also reflected somehow at the level of the dynamics and the fluctuations. So. You can really write down the general fluctuation in this particular form where you see you're multiplying by these U matrices, which capture the lowest flying modes, the consistent truncation, of the, low, the modes that are kept in the consistent truncation, and you're just tensoring with the scalar harmonics. And this way, you don't just recover the group theory, you will also recover, uh, in particular, very nicely the whole mass structure of the higher dimensional fields. And of course, like Eric said, this is somehow for maxi supersymmetric points, this is not surprising. They should have was always somehow maybe clear that something like this should exist just by thinking about the super multiple structure. Okay, so the final point, this immediately gives us a nice mass diagonalization. So unlike the traditional approach, where then you do this fluctuation and that's, and you have to spend a lot of time diagonalizing your equations of motion, here this will all arise automatically. And in particular, the whole differential problem is turned into a nice simple algebraic problem. In particular, the mass matrices can be expressed in terms of two simple objects. Um, the first are the objects which control the lower dimensional theory. These are structure constants of the lower dimensional gauges of the gravity, which just come when you compute uh, the generalized Lie bracket of these U matrices on each other. And then there's also, of course, the higher dimensional information that is not something that you have from the lower dimensional perspective. And this is, you need to know what happens if I act with the generalized Lie derivative of these frame fields on the scalar harmonics. Now, if you remember these generalized vector fields, there are always some vector fields plus some uh, P-form gauge fields corresponding to the generators of um, the local symmetries. If you act on a scalar like the scalar harmonics, this will always just reduce to the Lie derivative along the vector part. For the maximum symmetric point, these vectors of the general vector field, these are some killing vectors. And either way, this will then be some very nice object of the action of the killing vectors on the scalar harmonics, which I call this matrix T, Ta sigma omega. So this captures the action of the killing vectors on the scalar harmonics. And this is all we need to write down now the masses um, of all of the fields around the maximum symmetric point and also around any other point of the lower dimensions for gravity. In particular, this, this, for example, the scalar mass matrix takes the simple form, consists of three terms. Um, here I've written the mass matrix uh, in terms of some index i and sigma. Sigma labels the scalar harmonics. I, in this case, just labels the, the fields of the lower dimensional supergravity, the scalar fields. So I here is this um, is an index for the cosets for the coset E77 minus SUA in the algebra. So. And then you find scalar mass matrix has these three parts. The first is just the lower dimensional supergravity mass matrix, M0 IJ, with no action on the harmonics. Then you have a bit which does nothing on from the lower dimensional. Sorry. Yeah, and this, this lower dimensional mass matrix, this is just the mass matrix that we'd compute in the lower dimensional model. So it comes in particular, it's quadratic in the structure constants with the details not important. Then there's the second term, which does nothing on the lower dimensional supergravity modes and has some non-triple action only on the harmonics. And this is in fact just the mass matrix of the spin two field. This is this 
standard split two mass matrix. It can be written as some type of Casimir uh, of these T generators squared. And then finally, there's an object, the term which mixes non trivial action on the lower dimensional fields with the non trivial action on the harmonics. And this is, of course, where the interesting physics happens. And this n object here, this is just some uh, linear combination of these lower dimensional uh, structure constants, the x's projected in certain ways into this core set E77 minus SUA. And the details are not important. You get these very nice scalar mass matrices for which you can now evaluate the masses. And of course, the whole point is that while this is around the maximum symmetric point, which in many cases was already understood, what we can now do is we can also compute the masses around any other critical point of the lower dimensional theory. And all you have to do is you have to multiply all of the objects I showed you before by this E77 matrix, which corresponds to the forming the internal space. And crucially, one thing that is far from obvious is that you shouldn't change the harmonics on the internal space. You use exactly the same harmonics. So for example, even if this is some non trivial deformation of the seven sphere, you would use the same round seven sphere harmonics and you get this very nice mass matrix that I shown you previously that capture the full Kaluza Klein spectrum around these very non trivial deformations. Yeah. Um, let me see. So, this is the last around this, this general part of the talk. In the next bit, I'm just going to talk about applications. Is there any question about this method of the Kaluza Klein spectroscopy? So, why is that true? Why do you get to use the same harmonics? If you want. Um, you could always do this. The harmonics, the scalar harmonics on the internal space, they're just some complete basis for your scalar field. So you could have always done this. Right. But from obvious is that this is an intelligent way to structure your Kaluza Klein fields. And the reason why this is useful is somehow because um, the equations of motions only involve this generalized derivative. And so all of the uh, equations of motions will involve the generalized iteratives either of the u matrices acting on each other or on the y matrices. And essentially, you know what all of these are from the maxi symmetric point. And you can capture what happens as you deform the point just by multiplying these u matrices by the E7 element. And then you also know essentially what happens to these T matrices if you, you, know, you don't touch the scalar harmonics, which if you want, don't have some E7 structure on them. Um, yeah, but in some sense, you could always do this. You have complete basis of fields. Normally, this is not an intelligent way of doing it, but in the exceptional field theory, it is, and it makes life much, much easier. I see. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. I had a question. Sure. Um, so there seems to be some difference between the, the following two types of theories. So first, if we take a, a solution on the same scalar manifold at which there is a maximally Supersymmetric point um, on the one hand. So, so take the solution to preserve some, but submaximal supersymmetry. And on the other, a theory where the amount of supersymmetry is the same, but it just doesn't live in a compactification where there exists a maximally supersymmetric point. Um, so from the CFT point of view, these have the same uh, amount of supersymmetry, but you can use your technique in the case where there is a maximally symmetric point on the uh, moduli space but not in the other case where there isn't. So, so why, from the CFT point of view, should there be some kind of distinction in the amount of information needed to specify the, the spectrum? I, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be, but I'm just saying that the technique seems to reveal a kind of um, complexity diagnostic, which is interesting. Um, do you have any um, thoughts about this? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, maybe firstly, uh, let me slightly change what you said. Um, it's not true that you need a maximally supersymmetric. Yeah, uh, okay. So what we need is a lower dimensional gauge for gravity that has maximal supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. So that's that's crucial. Sure. And then, okay, as you say, sure, that there's, there's some point which doesn't have to be vacuum that would have this maximal supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. um, now, this I really don't, I don't have a CFT interpretation of this if you want. By C sorry, by CFT, uh, Eric, which CFT do you mean? Um, what do you mean? Uh, uh, do you mean a world sheet CFT? Uh, 
boundary, I mean, uh, dual. Yeah, the, the boundary dual, the boundary dual, yes. So. Ah, the boundary. Yeah. I'm just trying to distinguish between situations where you have two boundary CFTs with the same amount of supersymmetry, perhaps their global symmetries differ fine, but in the one case, seemingly you can determine the spectrum by these um, sort of secretly maximally symmetric methods. And then the other case, you can't. And these two theories may well be of different sort of levels of complexity in terms of how their spectra look, but it's just uh, neat that that is, that is a fact about the spectra and one can imagine trying to formulate this as some algebraic condition on the dimensions or something, which then you go look for in the space of theories. So, I mean, maybe, so for, let's see, so for, if I were to say that this only works if you have a maximally supersymmetric vacuum, then obviously this makes, I mean, then it somehow makes more sense because then somehow you're thinking about some, some vacuum that I can get by, or some CFT that I would get by doing some kind of RG flow or some kind of deformation of a maximally supersymmetric CFT. Then it makes sense. I mean, the more miraculous thing is that this also works even when, when the lower dimensional supergravity has maximum supersymmetry, even though it doesn't have a maximum supersymmetric vacuum. Mm -hmm. And that is not obvious to me, but even somehow this statement, I don't know really what that means and from the CFT perspective, because they're, I mean, somehow you really only talk about the vac, if, if you want, you only interpret the vacua of the gauge supergravity, not the points that don't have a vacuum. So that, I, I don't know, I don't know, Eric, um, but it's an interesting question. Okay, any other questions about this general part? Um, if not, I'll move on to some applications. Okay, so let me now just apply this. Sorry, I see there's a, whoop, there was a question. Can we use this procedure to construct a stable descender vacuum, maybe a stable vacuum close to a, uh, the sitter space. I will come back to the sitter just at the end and make, I mean, the vaguest of comments. Okay. I hope that's okay to call out. So, okay, let me now just get to some applications about the stability of non specific KDS4 vacuum. So, as I already said, um, these non specific ADS vacuum, they can be more efficiently constructed in lower dimensional theories. Um, but amazingly, they're somehow almost all of them are already unstable in the lower dimensional theory directly. So one thing that people hope is that somehow because this is already such a stringent requirement that somehow having this ADS factors is five picture in mind where the masses increase with the mode number, maybe having stability amongst the modes that are kept in the consistent location, what you might call zero mode stability should be enough to have a fully perturbatively stable in 10 or 11 dimensional super gravity. And now we're using these methods, you can test uh, this kind of form. In particular, as I said, there is a famous consistent truncation of the left dimensional supergravity on the seventh sphere, giving us some rich four dimensional SO8 supergravity with maximal supersymmetry. Uh, this was constructed first by David Nikolai and then this exceptional framework by various people. And in particular, it has an interesting non supersymmetric ADS4 vacuum. Um, which only preserves SO3 by SO3 symmetry of the SO8 symmetry of the seventh sphere. So this corresponds to deforming the seventh sphere in some way that only preserves this tiny amount of, sym of symmetry and breaks all of the supersymmetry. And in particular, this is the only non supersymmetric vacuum that is stable in this four dimensional SO8 supergravity. All the other non supersymmetric points are unstable already in four dimensions. That's so, Yes. The only one that is not, or is it uh, because I saw that we don't know absolutely all the vacuum? Right. So, so, don't, so it's, let's see, so uh, maybe I should say it's believed. Um, we don't, we don't know, we, we don't know whether we know all the non supersymmetric vacua of this theory, but there was some machine learning work uh, by is it comes up fishing fishbacher in 2019, which found a lot. They believe that they are all of the non supersymmetric points, but it's not clear that that's true. And certainly, of all of these, which are of the order of 200 vacua, this is the only one that is stable. But in principle, there could be other ones, which we don't know yet. Okay, 
So now we can use our method and we can compute the full spectrum of Kalina Klein fields, particularly if we look at uh, the zero mode on the seven sphere. This is just the n equals to eight supergraving p multiplet that was the masses were computed a long time ago, and these are stable. So here I'm showing the masses of the lowest lying modes. Here, this red line, this is the PF bound. And then here, this uh, uh, horizontal axis is roughly speaking um, a different mode number. The, sorry, the, the representations of these fields. So this K comma K, these are the representations on the SO3 times SO3 of the non specific vacuum. So then you can use our method, we could compute the modes at the first level. And amazingly, you see already the modes, the masses decrease. Uh, so this is very different from ADS5 times S5. The modes decrease. But amazingly, they're still just above the F bound. But then if you continue this at level two, then you find that you start getting unstable modes. So there are higher Kaluza Klein modes that are not kept in the four dimension, in the four-dimensional theory, which are unstable below the Python for you bound. And you can continue. For example, up to mode level three. And we did this up to mode level six. Eventually, you do find that the masses do increase, as was kind of the naive expectation. But at first, you get this uh, behavior where the masses decrease, and they decrease enough, as you see, that you actually get instabilities. OK, so to summarize this ADS4 vacuum that's non specimetric is unstable. And it's unstable in a way that you don't see from the four dimensional spirality. The instability comes from the higher collision time modes. And in particular, having stability just in the four dimensional theory is not enough to be stable in the higher dimensions. And I should say this vacuum also has a different kind of instability, what's known as a brain jet instability. I won't talk about this in any detail, but uh, this is work done by uh, Yossif and Nick, Christoph Pilch. So, uh, I mean, they're Maybe they're even here and you can always ask them about that. Okay, so now you can also use this for different vacua. There's another interesting example where you look at a consistent rotation on the six sphere of massive type two A supergravity. This again gives a four dimensional maximally supersymmetric theory with ISO7 uh, gauge symmetry. But amazingly, this doesn't have a maximally supersymmetric vacuum. So this is this kind of example that I was mentioned before. You get a lower dimension maximal gauge of gravity, but without a maximally supersymmetric vacuum. And the round six sphere is not a vacuum. Still, you can use all of the information from the round six sphere, like I've shown, to compute the Kaluza Klein spectrum around any vacuum in the theory, even though the round six sphere is not a vacuum. And in particular, what makes this theory so interesting is that it has seven non supersymmetric ADS4 vacua that are stable in this lower dimensional theory, corresponding to some deformation of the six sphere, which breaks all of the supersymmetries, and also various amounts of symmetries. Um, I will maybe skip the details, but what we found is that uh, the one which is mostly symmetric, so there's one of these ADS4 vacuum that preserves G2 bosonic symmetry. This one, we could compute the full spectrum, analytically and show it is perturbatively stable and massive to a supergravity. Um, the other six examples, which are stable in the four dimensional supergravity, we didn't compute the full spectrum, but we computed the spectrum up to level four. And we found that there's no instabilities up to level four. And level by level, the lowest line masses do seem to increase, do increase monotonically up to level four. So we, if you want, we found evidence that this would be perturbatively stable if this trend continues past. Level. Have you considered fermionic fluctuations as well? Uh, we haven't uh, we haven't done the fermionic fluctuations, but other people have. Um, and uh, maybe you're asking somehow if so. One thing you could have imagined is if somehow these theories, these vacua, are actually secretly supersymmetric, but the, the massless the massless gravitinos are not in the four dimensional theory. But that is not the case. So you can check the other people, um, Oscar Varela and collaborators, have computed the fermionic mass spectrum and shown that. They're not supersymmetric. So, but In fact, you, but you could also have tachyons from the fermionic sector. Am I, am I, yes, that's possible, right? You can't, you can never get tachyons from fermions. Uh, 
Sorry. Right. Can, can you always adopt the VFL? Uh, I don't understand. I'm not sure. Why well, why is that the case? Um, maybe Elias can. Uh, yes, you are muted if you are trying to answer. Sorry, what was the question? You're, you're saying that uh, the fragrance can never become a tachyonic. Well, I don't understand why this is true. Right, because the what enters in the fermionic mass is always M M dagger, and that's always positive. In any sense, uh, gas in any oh. quantum in any quantum field theory. So this is yeah indeed, and I, I guess also here I mean certainly you can write the mass matrix in exactly this form. You get a first order mass matrix, and then the the, the mass squared is that mass matrix uh, times its yeah. complex conjugate. So indeed, um, you you would have something positive definitely. Uh, thanks, Elias, for answering that question for me. Um, Okay, so I will maybe not talk at all about these non-perturbative instabilities and just make a brief comment at the end. Let me just mention a final example of this kind of story, which is quite interesting. So there is, again, some non-specimetric vacuum. This comes by looking at that to be supergravity, doing some consistent truncation on a phi sphere times a circle. This gives some particular four-dimensional gauge supergravity, again, maximum supersymmetric. What makes this so interesting is that it is in particular contains a two parameter family of non supersymmetric ABS4 vacua that was constructed um, just last year. So, in particular, you have these Chi1, Chi2 moduli, and they connect some uh, supersymmetric vacuum with N equals 4 supersymmetry. Um, this connects it to general non supersymmetric. Some two parameter non specimetric space of vacua. So for general chi1, chi2, you have uh, non supersymmetric ADS4 vacua with just U1 times U1 symmetry. But then for special values, like when the deformations are turned off, you have N equals 4 supersymmetry. When one of the deformations is turned off, you have N equals 2 supersymmetry, et cetera. So this modular space you have is quite interesting. Um, uh, there's another reason why these are so interesting. So this S5 times S1 geometry is non is, is very interesting in type 2B string theory. In the full 10-dimensional perspective is something known as an S float. So as you go around the circle, the type 2B background gets doesn't get mapped to itself, rather, it gets mapped to an SL2 monotony of itself, where this SL2 monotony is some particular hyperbolic element of SL2Z. So in particular, the dilaton is always small and its derivatives are small, but still you have this uh, S-duality mapping as you go around the circle. Um, now, if from this perspective, actually, um, it's worth just saying these chi-1-2 parameters moduli, they're very interesting. Uh, they have a nice geometric interpretation. If I do the reduction on the five sphere to get some five-dimensional theory, then these chi 12s chi 1, chi 2, they're like Wilson lines of the Kaluza Klein vector that you get from the five sphere. So, in particular, locally, these are always something uh, trivial. They can always be locally absorbed by some coordinate redefinitions, but globally, they cannot. So these are really some interesting moduli, which locally don't have any meaning. They can locally be absorbed by coordinate redefinitions, but globally, they're not trivial. And this is just like, for example, the complex structure on T2, the complex structure moduli of T2, are exactly of this type. So you can think of these as some generalization of T2 complex structure moduli. Okay. Now, uh, another reason why these are so interesting is that they connect the, uh, they give us a family of non supersymmetric ADS4 vacua. So in the dual theory, this would suggest that there's some non supersymmetric form manifold. Which was expect is expected by most people not to exist because it would require um, some huge amounts of cancellations and beta functions without any symmetry argument for them. But what we found is that somehow this still seems to happen. In particular, we computed the full Kaluza Klein spectrum. We find that all of the modes are stable. 
um, then also there seems to be some protection against non perturbative stability and also against perturbative quantum corrections. And crucial to this is that these Chi 1, Chi 2 deformations, they can locally always be absorbed um, by some corner transformations. So sorry, maybe I, I missed this, but, but, but these, yeah. uh, these non SUSY uh, vacuum, they, you're saying that they are stable? They are, they are perturbatively stable. And uh, well, we have, well, they're stable against various non perturbative phenomena. Um, that's what I'm saying. So let me, I won't, well, let me not show you. You can compute the Kaluza Klein spectrum. We just tell you it works. Everything is above the binary on the Friedman bound. Um, <clears throat> you might worry about non perturbative phenomena. There's something interesting happens. In particular, there's this conjecture by Oguri and Buffer that whenever you have fluxes in some non supersymmetric ADS vacuum, there should be some brains with um, the charge greater than the tension related to the weak gravity conjecture, um, which would then nucleate and give you some non perturbative instability. But we found that there are no such, well, at least uh, we searched and we couldn't find any such brains. In particular, somehow the brains, they're actually more stable than in the supersymmetric case. So tension is increases relative to the charge compared to supersymmetric case. Uh, you might worry about bubbles of nothing with the circle of ES5 shrink to zero, but this is there's also protections, the phi spheres fluxes. Um, and on the circle, you really don't have the right boundary conditions to allow this from the fermions. Uh, there could be some, there is some, maybe some non perturbative instability that was suggested by these, uh, but I'll just say it's a little bit unclear whether it can happen in this case. And you can ask more if you want. Uh, maybe the more interesting feature is that these ADS4 vacua also seem to be protected beyond this large n limit. So, in particular, if we look at perturbative quantum correction, so perturbative and alpha prime or GS. And these don't lift these non supersymmetric ADS4 vacua because of this diffeomorphism symmetry argument. So in particular, the Chi1, Chi2 moduli can always locally be absorbed by coordinate transformations, which in particular means that any diffeomorphism invariant quantity that I can write down, like the Ricci scalar, Ricci tensor, Riemann curvature tensor, any of the fluxes, they don't contain Chi1, Chi2. So in particular, Alpha prime GS corrections, which involve these lithium morphs and variant quantities, they will just be independent of chi one, chi two. Okay. I think I'm being told to stop. Yes, um, I'm just about to finish, Francesco. Uh, let me just mention you can make a similar argument for some recent suggested n equals to one exactly marginal deformations, which have very similar ADS4 structure. Okay, so really, I'm guessing one thing that could happen that would ruin these. ADS4 vacuum is some non perturbative correction. Um, but that's maybe, well, yeah. one could imagine some non perturbative phenomenon uh, lifting the ADS4 vacuum and then meaning that there is no uh, conformal manifold. But of course, then this would be some something that you don't see at large end. And so let me just conclude. So uh, exceptional field theory gives us a powerful tool to construct and study non supersymmetric ADS vacua. We can compute the full Kaluza Klein spectrum around uh, these non supersymmetric ADS vacua for the first time, determine the conservative stability. Now, if this non supersymmetric story is not of your liking, you can also apply this to the supersymmetric ADS vacua, use this for ADS CFT, where the Kaluza Klein spectrum gets mapped to the anomalous dimensions of operators in the CFT. And let me just end with a couple of open questions. Um, one thing comes back to maybe Eric's question. You can generalize this. You can try and generalize this and look at vacua of gauge super gravities that are not maximally supersymmetric. An interesting question would be going beyond ADS. Principle R method can be used for any vacuum of the gauge super gravities, which don't have to be of ADS type. And yeah, let me just end there. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emmanuel. Uh, so there's time for uh, one quick question, probably. Anybody? I'm happy to ask it. 
so there are people studying non-solutions of type 2b supergravity say for example Kotler and Jensen who've studied these wormhole amplitudes um, you have these techniques which seem to be able to say something about non-solutions uh, in their paper they study stability of these do you have any uh, ambitions to generalize to that setting uh, um, so need I mean um... What's very nice is exactly as you say, we don't, we're not restricted to computing uh, anything around the vacuum. We can compute kind of any quantity you want around the general point in your gauge supergravity, which doesn't have to be a vacuum. Um, there's a couple of things that we're looking at. For example, maybe you might ask what happens to the mass spectrum around RG flow, for example. Um, you think of this, the two point function along the RG flow. Uh, there's various generalizations like these, um, which yeah, we're starting to look at at the moment. We just there's kind of too many, too many things to try and do in too little time. But that's certainly a nice, interesting way to generalize. So beyond ADS vacuum, just looking at different points. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Maybe one more question. Maybe one. Uh, what, what is known of the of the gauge theory that would be belong to uh, to this uh, type to be uh, uh, ADS solution that you were talking about with the two? Uh... Yeah. Um, so you're asking about these um, S fold type vacua, and I guess what do we know about the the CFT side? Is that the question? Yes. Um, so. Um, I mean, so some general features we definitely need to understand. So these S-fold vacuum, um, <clears throat> they correspond to some, uh, well, they are often called J-folds of n equals four super young mills. So if you can, if you think about, you take n equals four super young mills, um, you could do some interface where the uh, gauge coupling constant tau just shifts uh, discontinuously. Here, this is something more interesting where I actually have a circle. So take n equals four square mils, you go back around the circle. As you go around the circle, the coupling constant shifts in exactly by this SL2Z monotromy. So this is relatively well understood for the non for the supersymmetric ADS4 vacuum. Now, these non-supersymmetric deformations, uh, we've made maybe some slight guess or proposal of what they could correspond to in the CFT but it's nothing terribly concrete if you want. So, I mean, maybe we all, it's best to just say, we don't really know. We don't really know what, how to think of them and why they should be this, why they should be exactly marginal from the CFT side. But you can make suggestions for things which are certainly marginal on the CFT side, which match them from the group theory. Well, in principle, there is a clear computation to do in the CFT side. So yeah, you, you could you could you could try and compute the beta function at least to some to some order. Okay, yeah. That that one we're trying to we, we haven't we haven't tried that yet, but that would certainly be very interesting and to see if anyone sees something, but I guess the um, my expectation would be that you would have to take into account non-perturbative corrections to see. Uh, the beta function on vanishing, but yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. So I think uh, we can conclude uh, this first uh, talk, and we thank uh, Emmanuel again.